Welcome back. We are in Psalm 73 today. I love Psalm 73, uh, but maybe not for the reason that you would think. It kind of breaks my heart a little bit because it reminds me of how fickle I can be depending upon my circumstances. Psalm 73 is a psalm of Asaph. And what is happening here is Asaph has uh, kind of noticed that the people who aren't honoring God, the people who want nothing to do with God, that their lives seem to be charmed. Their lives seem to be blessed. They seem to have everything they could ever want. And so listen to what Asaph says. He says, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. We've heard that before. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pains until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They're not in trouble like others are. They're not even stricken like the rest of mankind. So they wear pride like a necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge out because of how fat they are. Their hearts overflow with foolishness. They scoff and speak with malice. And he's talking about all these things, right? They look like they have everything they want. They don't seem to be in turmoil, Asaph is saying, like I am. Like That's really what he's getting at here. He goes, they don't seem to have the problems that I have. They don't seem to be uncomfortable like I am. They don't seem, they seem to have everything they want. Now, granted, we do see a lot of the prophets of God in uncomfortable places, but Asaph is one of the singers. He's one of these people who's writing psalms to be used by David's uh, son Solomon around the temple. Imagine this as a song, right? So he's, this is not Asaph's song, thankfully. Can you imagine announcing this as you're going into the temple? But uh, this is Asaph writing a story uh, about kind of how he's dealing with this idea of the righteous and the wicked. And he's saying, man, the wicked seem to have it so much better than we do. So he says this. He goes on to say, speaking of the wicked, they have everything they want or appear to have everything they want. He says, therefore, God's people turn back to them and find no fault in the wicked. So the people of God are now looking at how blessed the wicked seem to be. And they're going, you know what? Maybe they are doing it right. Maybe they, maybe we should take some cues from them. Uh, be careful of that, by the way. Looking at people who don't know God and taking cues from them on how you should do your life. They say, how does God know? Does God even know what's going on anymore? Is there even knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked. They're always at ease. They increase in riches. And, in, and then listen to what Asaph says. In vain. Have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence? That should take us back to the Psalms that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I am stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said I'll speak like them, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. So this is where there's the shift is beginning to happen. He's going, man, I almost slipped. I almost stumbled. I saw how blessed they were. I saw how favored they seemed to be. I saw how they seemed to get everything they ever wanted. And he goes, I just thought, man, like maybe we should follow suit. Maybe we should live like they live. Maybe we should do what they do. Maybe I'll speak like they speak. And he goes, no, I can't do that because then I would have betrayed your people, God. But then, then he says this, and this is where he's not thinking culturally anymore. He's not thinking temporarily anymore. He's thinking from a biblical, eternal perspective. And this is where Asaph's mind changes. He says, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed like a weary task. Until I stood in the sanctuary of the Lord and I remembered or I discerned their end. So he, he's, he's going, how do I get this? How, do I, how can I make sense that the wicked are, are, uh, seem to be blessed here and I seem to be cursed here? How do I make sense of this? And he goes and he meets with God and he says, then I remembered what their end was. And he says, truly, you will set them in slippery places. You will bring them to a ruin. How they will be destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly in terrors, like a dream when one awakes. O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you will despise them like phant phantoms. My soul was embittered. I was pricked in my heart. But I was acting like a brutish and ignorant animal. I was like a beast before you. So he says, look, God, I looked at them. I was jealous. And he goes, I was pricked in my heart. My pride was stirred up. And he goes, but when I was acting that way, I was like a fool. I was like an animal. I was like an ignorant, stupid beast in your sight. Uh, which is really interesting language because it's also the language that the Bible uses to talk about false teachers. False teachers are like ignorant, brutish animals. And so Asaph is going, man, I was behaving like someone who is false to God. And he goes, nevertheless, I am continually with you, God. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you receive me into glory. 
Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth I desire but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You will put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near my God. I have made my Lord my refuge and I will tell of your works. So there's this, I mean, this Psalm 73 is a journey. And I read it, um, I read it, fairly regularly to remind myself of the attitude that I'm supposed to have, the kind of the, how I'm supposed to think uh, correctly. Because I'm a 48-year-old man who, uh, I, I have friends, man, like I have friends who, it, it feels like sometimes, it feels like everything that I do to serve the Lord, everything that I do to honor the Lord, it feels like I don't ever gain ground. It feels like I'm I'm the same person I was 20 years ago. Like I'm just kind of, I'm getting by. Uh, everything's okay. I have what I need. I've got food on the table. But like every now and then it'll cross my mind. Like how come I'm, I'm seeking to give everything to the Lord? I've given up everything for the Lord. And sometimes it just doesn't feel like there's a return. And it's, man, that is a dangerous place to be. Because if our hearts, if, if our gaze is removed from the eternal God and brought down to temporary earth, to the temporary life we're living, you might find yourself uncomfortable. You might find yourself wrestling with this discontent. And yet, what does Asaph do? He remembers, he comes into the presence of God and he remembers their end and his and their end, the wicked, who seem to have everything and seem to live charmed lives, their end is destruction because they've denied God. And Asaph's end, and therefore our end, for those of us who have put faith in Christ, is that he brings us into glory. He takes us by the hand and draws us into his presence. And he becomes our portion. Uh, listen to what Asaph says. This is very, very important. Whom have I in heaven but you? There is nothing on earth I desire but you. My heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. We believers, we people of faith must come to the place where we say, God is the strength of my heart. God is my portion forever. Our lives can't be about the things that we desire. Uh, sorry, it can't be about the, the temporary things that, uh, that the, the wicked chase after. It can't be about those kinds of things that might temporarily fill us up, but won't bring us it, glory on the last day of Christ. And so we, we, live for, we live for Christ's sacrificial lives. And it doesn't mean that we won't have things and it doesn't mean that we'll be destitute. But I, I think of Peter saying to Jesus, he goes, Lord, he goes, we've given up everything to follow you. And Jesus says to him, yes, and you, you will be given more in this age, but in the age to come, you'll be given eternal life. Like the, the promise for following Jesus is that if it costs you everything, you still gain everything. And Asaph had to be reminded of that. And so I don't know what your situation is. I can't possibly uh, know who's watching this right now or what your thoughts are. But I need you to remember that our life is, does not consist in the possessions that we have or the dreams that we chase. Our life consists in Christ and we have eternity in him. And so if you need an attitude adjustment, 73rd Psalm is always helpful to me. And I hope it will be helpful to you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.